cancer. Well, a debilitating disease that really needs no introduction to this audience. And the numbers will keep on increasing. Uh, by the year 2030, there'll be about 22 million new cases that have been diagnosed, and pretty much majority of them will be in the developing world. And as a cancer biologist, what I'm majorly interested in is in these three questions. How can we prevent it? How can we detect early? And if detected, then how do we treat it? So before we understand how to tackle cancer, we have to understand what is it. Cancers are basically cells undergoing uncontrolled proliferation. So they start off with normal cells, that they start getting, gaining genetic mutations, and then they eventually start growing and then spiral out of control. They start with initial growth, which is pretty much a local benign tumor. But the problem comes in when they start migrating out of the local niche through blood vessels and spread out to different parts of the body and in a process called metastasis, and that's when it becomes malignant and starts colonizing these distant organs and starts affecting the normal body functions, eventually uh, leading to patients succumbing, succumbing to the disease. If you look at how it's been treated traditionally, it's really by the use of chemotherapeutic drugs. So a patient comes in, they undergo surgery, and then post-operative chemotherapy. Now, what are these chemotherapeutic drugs? Now, these are drugs that typically act on fast-dividing cells. And while generally it works, because typically you would see cancer cells dividing slightly faster than normal cells, these drugs do a miserable job as di at distinguishing between these fast-dividing cancer cells and normal healthy cells that could also be fast-dividing. And as many of you are aware of, this then results in severe and often fatal side effects. Um, and so there are many other reasons why it's difficult to treat tumors. And the, one of the main reasons is this one-size-fit-all chemotherapeutic approach has not been working so much, is that over the past decade or so, we've come to realize is that, in fact, the tumors come in all different sizes, all right? So there's no one-size-fits-all. In fact, not only are different cancers completely different disease, but even if you take one particular cancer, it can be very different from one patient to the other. And if you can zoom in into one particular tumor mass in a given patient, what you find is that different parts of the tumor are in fact very different. Shown here, a representative models is these red and green, red and yellow and blue cells. All right? And what happens is that these different parts of the tumors or different cells are addicted to different survival cues, and therefore they differentially respond to a variety of different treatments. Now the second major reason that therapeutics don't work so well is really because the tumors also can evolve upon the selection pressure of drugs. Now, if you think about it, life has been evolving on this planet for about 3.8 billion years. And the cell has had plenty of time to figure out mechanisms to evolve its way out of any harsh conditions, including, say, a cancer chemotherapeutic drug. So if you think about cancer, like this tree that you see on the left, where this branch the main trunk is the initial mass of cancer, and then it branches out into these different side branches that represent these different subpopulations, which have different properties. And say, for example, the red and the yellow branch are the fast dividing cells, and the blue are the slow dividing cells. You can think of chemotherapy as this pruning process for the tree. So what it'll do is that it'll get rid of all the fast dividing cells, and only things that's remaining is this resistant population, which is inherently slow dividing. The other problem that happens is upon the selection pressure of the drug itself, tumors can evolve. These red populations, for example, can undergo what's called adaptive evolution and start behaving more like the blue cells and therefore evade therapy. So clearly, uh, as you can imagine, it becomes this game of catch-up, like this chemo whack-a-mole where this hammer is the chemo, and the harder you hit, the stronger the evolution is, and you have these cancer moles popping out all over the place. And moreover, of course, you never get to see the cancers that are just lurking just underneath the surface, and these would be the inherently resistant, slow-dividing cells. And of course, the minute you remove the hammer, all these moles start popping up. So we have come to then realize that we need something else, right? There has to be a clear, disruptive approach and there's a clear unmet need to figure out better ways of tackling this 
unsurpassed complexity of cancer in terms of how heterogeneous it is and in, in terms of how we can tackle tumor evolution. And amongst the many um, technologies that are coming out there, precision oncology or precision medicine has been taking center stage. In fact, it's been in the news. So what is precision oncology? Well, in simple terms, it is giving the right drug to the right patient at the right time. How do you go about that? Now, there are two major ways that people are going about it. So the first is really one way to think about it is a major focus is on genomics-driven precision oncology, where you can basically start sequencing as many patients and as many tumors as you can and identify all the cancer-causing genes. And once you have identified all these causal mutations, if they're actionable, then you can develop drugs against them and then put them through the clinic. In fact, that's one of the major thrusts of the National Cancer Moonshot Initiative, which was recently announced by Obama and was led by Joe Biden. And the major driver for this is this genomics-driven approach to precision oncology that we want to sequence all the tumors to find as many cancer-causing genes as possible, identify those that are actionable, and then develop drugs. Now, for those of you who've been working perhaps in the drug industry or drug discovery industry and pharma, you would realize that from the identification, from the time that you identify actionable targets to putting a drug through validation and actually into the clinic, it could anywhere be between 10 to 15 years and two to three billion dollars. While this is, of course, a very valid approach, right? what we started thinking that is there anything we can, else that we could do in the immediate time frame? And this is often a question that my clinical collaborators talk to me about, that, Ram, this is really great, but how do I treat my patients who's actually sitting or recovering in the clinic and perhaps needs to be treated in the next four to, uh, four to six weeks? So this kind of resulted in an evolution in our approach of how to tackle cancer. And what I hope to um, showcase in the next few minutes is that our work, our more recent work, on what we call evidence or response-driven precision oncology. So what do I mean by that? It's based on a very simple idea, and the idea is that the best biomarker for treatment response is perhaps treatment response itself, as long as you assess it in a patient-individualized manner. All right? So what do I mean by that? Generally speaking, a patient comes in into the clinic, here shown on the left, they'll undergo the regular therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, followed by a period of recovery. At that point, if you don't see signs or symptoms of cancer, you're considered to be in remission. Now, the million-dollar question is, well, did it work, right? And can we actually predict whether the chemotherapeutic drug worked or not? And in fact, if it does not work, can we come up with alternative ideas or therapeutics that would perhaps work on this particular patient's tumor? So in order to do that, what we do is that as soon as the patient's coming to the clinic for surgery, we get part of their tumor samples that's brought to my lab. And then we develop what's called patient-derived avatar models, so either in mouse or cells in culture. Now, these then maintain the heterogeneity and all the properties of the patient's tumor, right? And they're called avatars because we are basically giving the tumor a new life, but outside the host. Now, what we can do, and that's very cool, is that we can take these avatar models and treat them with the same chemotherapeutic drug that the patient's undergoing in real time in the clinic. And with these chemotherapeutic drugs, then we could design in an accelerated time frame with the protocols that, we've, uh, that we have developed in the lab, resistant models in the lab itself. So as you can see in real time, perhaps, that the patient would take about eight to 12 months before they come back to the clinic, but in accelerated time points, it takes about a quarter of the time. Now, there are two major advantages to that. Firstly, we can take this patient's own resistant models and try to understand better what are the underlying mechanisms that evolved resistance or metastatic phenotypes. But the second major thing that we could do is that we can take these tumor models and put them through a drug screen. So put them through a drug screen across all FDA-approved um, anti-cancer uh, libraries and identify drugs that could potentially be useful in eliminating this resistant model for this particular patient. Now, the idea is that if, the now, if now the patient does come back to the clinic, unfortunately, um, then we are already ready with alternative therapeutics that could possibly work in the patient. And that, of course, could be tested in the clinic. And the hope is that would work in eliminating this particular patient's 
um, resistant tumor models, tumors. So if you now think about it, if we now project it in the future so we can, as we scale up this approach, going into many, many patients, then we can start mapping all the genetically defined heterogeneity as well as the cancer signaling uh, signatures with treatment response as well as alternative therapies for inpatient-derived models. Now, all this information with all the permutations and combinations can then be fed into a computer, and upon big data analysis and through a process called machine learning, we can teach the computers to then predict what kind of drugs may or may not work for a patient that's recruited in the future into the study. So a patient comes in, for example, that shows a very similar profile to something that we've already screened before, we could then predict what kind of drugs may work, and most importantly, we can also predict whether standard chemotherapy would work or not. And as you can imagine, the dreams for a future is that, in fact, a patient can be recruited at any point in time and at any stage, uh, and simply from a surgically resected sample or a biopsy sample, we can generate the patient-derived avatar models, put them through our screens, and then be able to predict either efficacy of the chemo drug or guide alternative therapy. Now, this is all well and good, and it's really important to dream, but does it work in the clinic in reality? Based on that, let me tell you a story that's emerging from the lab that we are very excited about. And the story starts with a 60-year-old cab driver in Singapore <clears throat> who presented himself at the National Cancer in Singapore in October 2014, just about a year and a half ago, with oral squamous cell carcinoma in his mouth cavity, as well as lymph node metastasis. He underwent the regular treatment of surgery and post-operative chemotherapy. And typically for stage four cancers, you get a median survival rate of about a year. However, patients usually do come back with recurrent tumors, which at that point, they are resistant to therapy. And very uh, soon after that, you run out of treatment options. So we started wondering, could we do anything about this patient? Basically, could we predict and could we, uh, whether chemotherapy was going to work or not, and could we predict alternative therapies? So we then set out to generate the entire spectrum of these avatar models, both in animals, in cell cultures, as well as these 3D models. And then we did drug screens. So what you see here is just the primary cells as well as the metastatic cells. And in order to visualize them better, we can use genetic and molecular techniques to color them. So we colored these cells, the primary cells, green and these metastatic cells red. So these are basically representing these different subpopulations that I was talking about. And then if we can combine these cells in a particular well and treat them with drugs and look to see if they respond to therapy. So this is a snapshot of a drug screen in this particular patient. What you're looking at is a 384 well plate. Each little rectangle is a little tiny micro well where we've added one of the FDA approved drugs. All right. And then you're looking to see whether the red or the green cells respond. So you can see it much better when you zoom in. What you find is that an untreated control, both the green and the red cells are pretty happy, right? happily coexisting. We find drugs that are just non-specifically killing all the cells, and these are typically highly toxic to normal cells as well, so not necessarily a very good idea to put back into the clinic. However, we found very interesting examples of drugs that are specifically targeting individual populations, either the green cells or the red cells. And now you can imagine that perhaps combination of these drugs could be perhaps better alternative therapies that could target all the different subpopulations without having severe side effects. Now, while this was really interesting, let's come back to the questions that could we really predict and what really happened. So the short answer to that question is yes, we could. So the patient's avatar models, this is just to show the tumor survival of the avatar models at increasing doses of this chemotherapy. And what you can see, it survived 100% of the time. So if we had predicted that general standard chemotherapy was most likely not going to work. And unfortunately, even though not surprisingly, this patient was in fact back in the clinic within six months with now a locally advanced tumor behind his ear and now his metastatic lymph node metastatic cells had spread to the lungs. As luck would have it, however, like I said, we had already generated all the avatar models, and we had screened them for a variety of different drugs and had identified some drugs that we thought would work in a very targeted fashion without necessarily having too many side effects to eliminate this cancer patient's tumor cells. 
And we so, together with the tumor board approval, as well as our clinical collaborators, we took it to the clinic. And what we were very pleasantly um, surprised to see is that there was a massive response in the clinic. So that's untreated and that's treated. And you could see the tumor before treatment, it's pretty much fallen off all the way down to the bone. And even the lung nodes, met metastatic nodes, are now going away. So again, corroborating that simple idea that we started with, that perhaps the best biomarker for treatment response is response itself as long as you assess it in the patient individualized manner. In addition, now we've also sequenced uh, this patient's DNA, and what's, what we can show is that there is this particular genomic alteration that we find in this chromosome 11 of this patient. Now, what's interesting about this particular alteration is that we can, we can now show that this particular alteration, not only does it make this patient cell sensitive to the drug that we've identified that works, but it also promotes a resistance to chemotherapy. Now, if you come back and think back at what I told you about machine learning, once we have the data all fit into a machine, then the next patient that comes along which has a similar genomic alteration, we could already predict that chemotherapy may not work and also provide them with perhaps the same drug that's based on what worked for patient X. All right, now that's a dream. And then this patient does not necessarily have to undergo unnecessary chemotherapy. So just to summarize then, we think that our evidence-driven precision oncology platform using these patient-specific avatar models we can predict response. We can map the trajectory of tumor evolution, therefore try to understand these earliest events that drive resistant disease and metastatic disease. And in the end, we hope to guide and change clinical practice. None of this would happen unless we do it in a multidisciplinary collaborative fashion. And this is basically an effort of clinicians, computational biologists, technology platform leaders, industry partners, and of course, scientists such as me. So let me just then conclude by our own moonshot. Our moonshot is to be able to convert late-stage cancers into a chronically managed disease with minimal side effects so that now patients can start living with their cancers rather than die from it. And we think we need these disruptive technologies that would allow us to give the right drugs to the right patients at the right time. Thank you very much.